So I think the chancellor asked many provocative questions, and I'm sure we'll now have the chance to ask the same questions of our chair panel. But before I introduce the panel, I want to uh, personally thank all of you for coming. I know you're all busy, but uh, by showing your friendship and support to the department, you definitely make us strong. So, so thank you again for coming. I, I, I noticed that many of you have already started using the app. And as uh, YY mentioned, we will use the app to be asking questions. And so if you go to your uh, app and go to the Q&A, uh, then you can type in your question. And, and you should be sure to identify yourself so that we can acknowledge your question too. But you can be anonymous if you so choose. So uh, let me invite, I think this is a really special time for us. Uh, it's possibly uh, one of the few times or maybe the only time when we have all past and present chairs uh, available at the same time in the same room. And I'm going to invite them uh, uh, in, in the order in which uh, they, they became chair in the department. So Professor Walt Burkhardt, uh, please come on stage. Uh, and, and, and please come on stage as I call your name. Uh, Patrick Diamond, Gil Williamson, Jean Ferrante, Larry Carter, Ron Graham, uh, Mohan Paturi, Keith Marzullo, and Rajesh Gupta. <coughs> Let's thank you. <coughs> Uh, we are ready to start, and, and if there are people uh, watching in the overflow areas, they could type in their questions as well. All right, so uh, I guess the question that you know, most inquiring minds would like to know is what exactly does the chair do anyway? So, so maybe we'll start with that question, and I'll ask all of you to introduce yourself, maybe say when you were chair, and then uh, you could take some time to answer the question. So we'll start with Walt. Hello, I guess this is working. I'm Walt Burkhard. I was chair from the beginning, 1987, until 1990, thereabouts. Uh, what does a chair do? A chair, in fact, serves as a conduit between the administration and the faculty, representing the faculty to the administration and vice versa. <clears throat> Uh, the chair also has a responsibility of assigning teaching duties, and sometimes this is interesting, and sometimes it's a little bit extra work. And there's committee assignments. Uh, that's basically what I recall the chair's job being. Hi, I'm Patrick Diamond. I was here for uh, spring, uh, I was chair spring quarter 1991. Pretty short. You're probably thinking, man, one quarter, he must have been really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but there's more to it than that. Uh, I, uh, I, it was already known when I started to be chair that it, I had to leave it for personal and uh, family reasons to go to Toronto. So um, uh, I can only tell you a little bit about what I thought the chair did. Um, one thing I did. Uh, I think what the chair does one thing is keep everything moving, keep the ship of state from sinking or going backwards. And that just involves running around all the time trying to understand what's going on and how to make it better. Um, another thing the chair does, I think, is um, you, you make sure the rules are followed and you make things come out right. So those are two different objectives. And if you're a good chair, you manage to do them both. And that's, that's the art of being a chair, I think. Um, and uh, I'll pass it on to Gil. Thank you. <clears throat> so I understand now how Vasco da Gama would feel if he were put here to say a few words about navigation. It's uh, being a chair, when I first came into the department in 1991 to 96, uh, we had 16 as, uh, assistant professors and 10 tenure professors and a very fine staff, uh, some of which are still here now. Um, and uh, I came from the mathematics department. I was a combinatorial mathematician, and algebraic combinatorics in the beginning, but about 1972, I got interested in the work of Targen, Bob Targen at Stanford, and uh, decided we needed to have a more geometric notion of algorithms, and that, I devoted myself to that and had a number of fine students until 
uh, about 1991, I guess the spring, and uh, I think it was uh, Patrick here or somebody asked if I wanted to be chairman of the computer science department as I was sitting one day in my office. And so I came, and my, my challenges as chair were a little different and unique. First of all, we had 16 assistant professors who were milling around, wondering what they had to do. They were excellent from excellent institutions. Well, what do I do to get promoted? Uh, I had some graphic uh, advice on that. And uh, had, they also needed an intellectual challenge. And I, being a combinatorialist and knowing the mathematics they were using, I was able to uh, work with them on that and to give them some, in, uh, get them going and challenging each other intellectually. So that was the number one challenge. The second one revealed itself in one of the comments made here. There's a, there was the electric, I, I came here in 1965, that's the same year Henry Booker came here and founded this electric electrophysics department that you saw mentioned. And there were computer scientists in there, or they considered themselves computer scientists, but they were actually physicists. And, and then APIS, and then EECS, a lot of applied physicists spread around who thought they were computer scientists and wondered why we would even bother to have a computer science. And I sensed a real um, rise of sort of uh, hostility, not a mild hostility that could be very dangerous to the computer science department. So that was my other big task, was to convince these guys that they really needed this computer science department. And uh, this is not the time to go into that, but uh, that was the last task. And then the third task was this conduit with the dean, where I felt the conduit should be narrowed as much as possible to give people time to work on their work. Uh, so I developed what I called the cookie theory of dealing with the dean. When the dean asked us to do something, I estimated how many cookies he had to eat to get the calories to suggest it. And then I made sure that we spent exactly the same number of cookies responding to it. Gil's a hard act to follow. <laughs> so I'm Jean Ferrante. Um, I was department chair from 1996 to 1999. Came here from IBM Research. Um, with Larry Carter, who was the following chair. Uh, and uh, besides everything else that people have told you about, I think the other thing that a chair does is really try to um, get the department uh, uh, as a whole to think about where it wants to go in the future. And so when I came in, it was um, after one of these down cycles and on a period of growth. And so we hired actually quite a number of um, new faculty. And as a chair, I was pretty involved in recruiting. Um, we also, uh, as you heard before, uh, decided to go for um, an NSF research infrastructure grant because we felt that to really be a top 10 department, we needed to have at least one. And so I remember going to Joe Pasquale and, and uh, saying, Joe, you're obviously the right person to lead this. And he said, um, OK, but I'll only do it if you'll be co-PI. So I said, yes, of course. And we went ahead and did it, and we, we got it. And so those uh, two things, the, the um, growth in the department uh, recruiting uh, and also the research infrastructure grant were really, really um, um, goals that we set for ourselves in those, uh, in those three years. Um, I was uh, convinced to be chair because of uh, Gil, who uh, was very persuasive. Um, and then I had to convince the next chair to, 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 to take it on, but he did. <laughs> so I'm Larry Carter. I was chair for uh, two, uh, 1999 to 2000. And uh, I felt that the main thing that I spent my time doing was writing letters for promotions and writing letters for hiring and trying to figure out how to sell these people to uh, the uh, CAP committee and other uh, deans and things like that so that we could hire the people that we wanted. Um, two other things that came along was the opportunity to get a new building and the opportunity to apply for the Cal IT, which we're sitting in now. And I think I did a fabulous job, particularly on the latter, by hiring Larry Smarr, who went to all the work of putting together the proposal, uh, even though he hadn't quite uh, started working yet. He did this on his own time before coming here so that he would have the place he wanted to work in when he got here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then I figured out that the best way to get out of being chair is to go on sabbatical, so I did that. <laughs> uh, I'm Ron Graham, 
And uh, as you just heard, uh, I was uh, filling in for Larry's sabbatical, who had planned possibly to come back and continue his chairmanship, but it uh, didn't happen that way. And uh, like Larry and Gene, I had a background from Bell Labs, and I saw one of my duties to uh, create the best possible environment for researchers to, to do the best work they could, and at the same time, try to create an environment in which students would get maximum benefit. Uh, one of the things that I did as chair that, that brief year was to groom the next chair, because if you don't have someone to replace you, you can get stuck at that job. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, but that, our, but that uh, particular person is not on stage right now. I think mm -hmm. he's very busy. So uh, uh, we'll pass this on to the person who became chair after that chair. Uh, my name's Keith Marzullo. I was the chair from, I think, 2006 to 2010. I got to follow uh, Mohan Paturi, who's the person sitting right here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was fortunate because Mohan, uh, Mohan did many things, uh, including uh, much of the heavy lifting in the design of our, our new computer science building, and also he did some wonderful work in helping set up a, a method of hiring. Um, he did some really heavy lifting in that. And so I was able to come in and enjoy the fruits of his labor, which is always a wonderful thing to do. Um, uh, although the, the first thing I had to do was confront a uh, where we were going to put the machine room, because when we designed the building, we forgot that we needed a machine room. Um, uh, and otherwise, um, I think I'm going to echo everyone down here. I think what a chair does is, is tries to make the environment be as conducive for the faculty to be successful. Um, uh, a good chair should be, uh, at least in good times, be as invisible as possible and make everyone seem as successful as they can be by trying to provide top cover, narrow the channel to the dean when necessary, or open it up if necessary. And speaking of effective chairs, I'll pass to the next one. Let me see if it's working. Um, the wonderful thing about being a chair, yeah. wonderful thing about being a chair uh, after such a distinguished line is that they've already done the job for you, including answering that question. <laughs> so I'll tell you something subtle that I spend a lot of time doing, and chairs, Keith is right, are to be seen, not heard. And so what is it that you do beyond keeping the trains running? It took me a year to get to that point, and that is really understanding deeply the ambitions of each of the parts of the department. What does the faculty really want? Not want in the terms of, I want this. What do they aspire to? Whether is it an environment in which they can do collaboration with somebody else? Or is it something they want to do with biology or cognitive sciences? What do the students want? Undergraduate students. What are they looking for? Understanding that. What does the staff want? Understanding that and then making it happen or at least giving the illusion that it is happening. So, uh, it, so it taking this is a very subtle thing, but it grows up on you. Uh, and, and, and it took me a while to understand. And when I started doing that, I got to a very wonderful place because the ambition, the aspiration of the faculty was, I would say, way out of line with where they were. In the sense, they all thought that they were in top five departments. So in order to get to top five department, you must first imagine that that's how you're going to, that's how, where you are. So what does the chair do? Um, you stay out of the way. Uh, we are the demilitarized zone between a bunch of faculty and administration with secret handshakes. Um, uh, and so we are not loved by anybody. We just have to do our stuff. But it is absolute marvel. When we write the promotion letters, when we write the cases, we get to understand, oh, so this is what he or she did. That is what advanced that knowledge frontier. And you get to know all of computer science in the few years you're a chair. Very nice. Um, and I think we have an embarrassment of riches here. There's just too many wonderful questions. So what I'm going to do is 
being the moderator, I'll pick and choose some questions. But if you find these questions to be too hard, you can choose a question and answer another question. You know, you wish all tests were like that. So, so, so feel free to answer the question you'd really like to answer. But in the meantime, I think we'll take up the question from Professor Rick Belou, which is a nice question, I think, as computation becomes central to all disciplines, where does computer science end and informatics begin? All right, so Rajesh, maybe we'll start with you this time. <laughs> you should never be caught with the microphone uh, with you, and especially on. Um, uh, it is a question that Larry posed. Uh, and we had a whole day of meeting two years ago. We called it CC 2020. And we asked the question, where will computer science be? I am humbled by the fact, as technologists, almost every prediction we make is wrong. In semiconductor industry, where I come from, everything we said will happen did not happen. And it, something else happened which was much more wonderful. Much, much, much more. We know for sure what the ingredients are. What will it look like in terms of the final product, we don't know. The ingredients absolutely cross the boundary across engineering and away from engineering. We, as I talk to you, are looking at appointments of faculty members with Department of Pediatrics. Can you imagine a faculty member who is shared with Department of Pediatrics? We already have a faculty member with Cognitive Sciences and Visual Arts in communication someday. So where does computer science begin? Or where does society and computer science begin? I think is a rhetorical question, probably not worth answering, because we're going to be embedded, uh, embedded in this. I know one thing. Our inspiration in computer science will come from something other than the devices that, call, that are called computers. Whether it is healthcare, whether it is transportation, or energy, or water, or any other thing, we don't know that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's how I see it. How can you answer anything past that wonderful, that wonderful answer? Um, it, it is truly hard to predict where computer science is going. Um, and I don't even know what it means for informatics to begin. Um, I can tell you that the part that has me fascinated, the thing that I think a lot about, is the interaction between the computer sciences and the social sciences, the rise of, of the fact that the systems we're building, the things that we're doing are truly socio-technical systems and our ability to understand how people react to them, how they'll, how they'll use them, how they change our society is vital. Um, uh, one of the things I've been doing since being chair was, was bringing in people from the social sciences in the area of cybersecurity and the kinds of discussions that they have on things of privacy, of course, but in, po in policy in terms of how you change the laws. Um, they're, they're all part of the things that we need to understand as we move our field forward. And it also has a side effect that is creating a lot of diversity in the field. Um, we're bringing in many more women and, and uh, underrepresented minorities by bringing in the social sciences and including them in the discussions. So I think this is all a very healthy way to go. That's, I think, where we're going. Yeah. I think Keith also might want to say something from the perspective of the National Science Foundation, where he's been for the past few years and has kind of a broader perspective. So. I, by the Anti-Deficiency Act of 1870, I'm unable to answer that question. <laughs> I really apologize. Um, uh, but national priorities are important. So I'm going to answer a total different, totally different question, uh, namely, what direction would I like to see the field go and, and the university go? And my answer to that is, I think that it's uh, a mistake that the way you get ahead in academia is you focus very narrowly on one specific topic and you become the expert. And that's kind of necessary in order to get tenure and it's necessary to build a great reputation. But it's an awful lot more fun to be one person among a group of people who are doing something entirely different. But if you know the computer science and you're working with a physicist or working with a biologist or working with uh, somebody in, uh, in the arts, then you get to have the fun of knowing your field and getting to learn from them. And I think it's very important that our students learn how to be adaptable, how to be uh, agile. And the way to do that is if our faculty does that as well. 
And so the change that I hope will happen is people will stop focusing on one topic where they are the lead person and they uh, you know, are the editor of the journal, and they start looking at multidisciplinary uh, topics that they can be working on. It's not surprising I agree with Larry on that. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to maybe um, turn to um, a different question as well, following this trend. Uh, how do you balance so many roles, chair, researcher, supervisor, et cetera, and there's a long list of et cetera. And you know, that's actually a, a difficult question that I think probably everyone along here has struggled with. Um, you know, there are various ways to do that. I think one is to have two offices and to have one hat in one office and the other hat in the other office. Uh, that implies that you're setting aside a certain amount of time for these different activities. Um, also, uh, you know, um, uh, the whole role of students when you're, you've taken on um, a large administrative role like chair is, is, a, is a difficult one because uh, you really want to do your best for your students. You want to make sure they're getting you know, the educational experiences that they need to be successful at the end. And so um, again, you may um, not take on as many students, but the ones that you have, you really have to um, make sure that they're getting a, as much um, attention as, as they need to, to be successful. One of the ways that um, uh, did that was by co-advising. I'm not sure it saved any time, but it really uh, allowed the students to get different perspectives and to um, think about you know, uh, what they wanted to do, uh, uh, hearing different advice from potentially uh, multiple mentors. OK. <clears throat> Hope I'm not supposed to see that. I better get to the Shiley Eye Center pretty fast. <laughs> okay, here, at some point, will computer science cease to be a discrete department integrated? Um, th this is somewhat like the situation I mentioned when I first came in, where the physicists were all computer scientists. And uh, the thing, uh, you can think of physics, physicists use mathematics, um, and they use it widely and they'll draw from any field. But what they use it as basically is a computational uh, substrate w with the confines of the theory providing the, the, the syntactic discipline so that they can now tell stories about it. This is the Higgs boson and this is that. Their stories are stories that are not part of the mathematics. And the physicists that I dealt with when I talked about this and so forth and pointed out that for the type of work going on in computer science, the, physicist, the substrate, the mathematical substrate, is discrete mathematics. I mean, you, your computer has a certain finite time when nothing's happening, no matter how big it is now, finite, as long as it's finite. And uh, so uh, there's this different mathematical substrate, and knowing that mathematical substrate for your own subject is essential. This is like CSC 20 and 21 on steroids. You need to know that to do computer science properly, and I'll defend that with any of these guys here if we want to discuss it. But if you, if you distribute it around to physics already, they don't know, they may be beginning to know it better now, but certainly in my day, they did nothing about combinatorics or logic and so forth, the essential things you needed to know for computer science. Now, if you distribute it further out into the other periods, philosophy and, well, I don't know where you're planning to distribute it here, but uh, it's going to run into that same problem. It's fine to do that, I mean, just in practical terms, but you have to maintain a group of people who understand the mathematical foundations of what they're doing. That's my feeling on that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, there's no doubt that computer scientists learn a different way of thinking uh, as opposed to biologists say and if you you know when you when you do when you want to do computational biology it's a problem because they they, they just uh, the biologists have a certain way of approaching a problem and the computer scientists have a different way and that can that's very fruitful but it's also uh, without the right background you don't have the right way of thinking about things I think so that's um, but computer science is going everywhere obviously they're going to become intelligent and take over the world shortly. Um, uh, will, yes, there will be cookies at lunch. Uh, <laughs> can we have a printer in every office? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I, I would like to talk about recruiting as being the uh, key to making a, a successful department and, uh, and how that's one of the biggest roles of the chair. 
Yes, uh, bringing in the right people. It's a full-time occupation, not only for the chair, but also for the faculty uh, members, but uh, it, it's what makes the huge difference. Uh, so I was gonna tell a story that uh, Walt Savage told me. Uh, he was, I think Walt was the first of the real uh, computer scientists, as opposed to the physicists that uh, went into computer science. Before him, there was Ken Bowles, who, uh, who put the department, uh, well, I shouldn't say on the map, he, he, he made the department a household word in every household that had a computer back then uh, with UCSD Pascal. Uh, but um, Walt came in as a computer scientist in the old Department of Electrophysics that we came from, you heard about. So he told me he was recruited by two faculty members. Uh, I mean, he was, came to the campus and some people took him out for lunch or dinner and uh, he said, but those, those people left after I joined. Uh, and I said, well, who, who are these disgruntled professors that left their jobs after you joined? And he said, uh, Erwin Jacobs and, uh, and uh, Andrew Viterbi. <laughs> so, so I mean, uh, yeah, so the, they did their job back then. They recruited, uh, you know, the right guy. And recruiting is really vital for us. So I, I certainly agree that the cookies are a good, good thing to have at lunch. Um, I'd like to talk a little about where I see computer science going in the future. Um, hopefully the department uh, will certainly go along these direct, in this direction as well. Um, I think there's going to be a much bigger interaction between um, computer scientists and people in the biology, biological fields. Um, how do, what is the role of computers in uh, biology? Uh, is there anything, how, how does computers, how will computers, computer science topics and um, evolution, for example, um, competition, all of these things, um, how does this all work together? This is a field that I think is really just at very begin its very beginnings, and computer science will be able to play a very large role here. Uh, with that, with that sort of insight, if I look at the list up there anymore, I'm sure there are other interesting questions. But maybe it's time for lunch. But I won't. I won't say anything about that. I will let. Oh, we have, we have time for a few more questions. Your exam's not over yet. So, <laughs> so uh, let's, let's uh, address the question of how alumni can best help advance the department. And uh, it's, the question seems to be anonymous, but I suspect it comes from the alumni board. And even if it doesn't, I'd like to take a minute to recognize the alumni board for their activities. They're sitting here in the audience. So. <laughs> now. Now, of course, if, you know, if they were to ask me that question, I'd say the answer is simple, just give us more money. Uh, yeah. But that's why I'm not chair here, so maybe we should let the chairs weigh in on this question. Walt, go All right, I, I will take a stab at this. When I was chair, the department was very small. In fact, when the department started, there were, there were only eight faculty members. Um, and so keeping the department afloat was very, high on my uh, agenda, didn't have time to think about doing development things or bringing in alumni. Alumni, we didn't have any at that <laughs> point. Uh, it was a new, new deal. Uh, but I, I could conjecture that it would be good to bring in the alumni to give, to, to tell students, here's what you could do if in fact, when in fact you graduate. Uh, certainly donating money is good, but there's more to it than just donating money. With that, I will pass the microphone. Uh, I, I, I don't, uh, since I'm at a computing department, I, I just won't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, one thing I can say about that, that I'm, I just tend to like things that are fun to do rather than worry about the money, but uh, the, uh, I'm a, my undergraduate, 
I was an undergraduate at Cal, Caltech, California Institute of Technology, and uh, my wife and I go back, you know, every other year at least, and sometimes twice a year, to what they have as alumni colleges, where faculty uh, present the latest work to people who are alumni and who, uh, being interested in it, understand it. And it's a, it's a very good opportunity for me to get, be able to talk to some of the excellent people at Caltech, and, uh, and, to talk, and it's a good experience, and I think it builds good uh, strength, intellectually, it builds good strength between the alumni and the departments, departments of engineering. Say. I think the um, best thing that alumni can do is um, get involved in the department. Uh, you know, when you think about um, someone giving an $18.5 million gift, that seems like, whoa, I'll never be able to do that. I'll never be able to do that. But um, there are things that, you know, you can really help with from mentoring some of our students, um, uh, ad, you know, being a co-advisor on some projects. Uh, if you work for a company, getting that company to um, donate some computers or, you know, whatever it is that we're needing at the time to furnish labs. Um, so there are a lot of, lot of different ways that alumni can be involved. And I think the best thing for us would be to really develop that relationship and um, see what, you know, you, you're interested in and then it's a win-win situation. So I think that the emphasis on ranking is a little bit overdone. Uh, maybe we'll get into the top 10 someday, but I don't think we're going to get into the top five until our alumni actually go out and do incredible things, until we're graduating people who are d the uh, Bill Gates or whatever of the future. And so another thing you can do is do great work, and when you run into people, tell people that you came from uh, UCSD. Well, I'd like to second that, and especially uh, what Jean and Larry said about the alumni board. I know sitting in the front row, I had a super tutor, Leilani Gilpin, who's here, who's now promoting the good word. Uh, and she might have some advice from another issue that I think our current chair, in fact, university is facing. Uh, right now in the CSE 21 required course, we have 410 students. Well, that's kind of, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> and so we're, rapidly trying to develop the ability to do uh, computer-based grading, for example, which I think the whole issue of flipping classrooms and the MOOCs, for example, we have a very, looks like it'll be a very successful Coursera course uh, designed by Pavel Pevsner. Uh, and this is certainly something that kind of institutions around the country are looking at closely to see just where it's going. So I think that's something that uh, for example, the alumni board might have perspective on what it was like when they were here and where it's going and, and as they talk to the current students, what their impressions are. By the way, as far as uh, handling all the various jobs of chair, uh, I think being a juggler is uh, very helpful. <laughs> and, you know, as they say, uh, you've always got 24 hours in every day, and if that's not enough, well, you've always got the nights. <laughs> we actually had a, uh, an applicant, an undergraduate, who wanted to come in under a, I think it was a San Diego fellowship. And in doing that, they, they had to explain why they were adding diversity to the department. And the person said, well, I can juggle. And we were able to say, well, our chair can also ride a unicycle while juggling. So we already have that <laughs> diversity represented in the department. Um, uh, alumni are a product. I mean, one of the many products we have. and. Uh, it's an important to have a strong tie with the alumni. Alumni help you a lot by going out, by doing great things, by making ties, by uh, talking with our students, uh, talking with applicants, uh, spreading the good word. Uh, I've, I've been at UC San Diego for 20 years. Gil hired me. Um, and when I came here, UCSD was an, kind of an anonymous place. It was uh, a sort of, it was a good university, but people didn't seem to have much pride as compared to other universities. And I think in the time we've been here, especially in the last 10 years, we've grown a lot in terms of having a recognition. Our alumni are doing great things. One of the accomplishments I did was to set up this alumni board, did this with Lindsay. Thank you guys for doing this. You guys are wonderful. Um, 
And the idea there was to try to build this tie with the alumni and our future students, our alumni and our current students, and the activities they're doing in resume writing workshops and in running these kinds of barbecues to bring people together, to uh, meeting the transfer students and their parents, telling them why they should come to UCSD and not UCLA or Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, this is uh, an invaluable role that we have, and it'll continue to grow. So a future is built on past. You are known by your past, not by your future. And alumni is the connection that we have from our past to future. There's a reason why campus, among many administrative reasons, recently reorganized to put career services under alumni. So at a very fundamental level, you give us the identity. Alumni is the identity. Now, if that identity is strong in whatever organization you're in, we are strong and our future is bright. If that identity is not strong, then we will not have a strong future. That is the philosophical side. Let me tell you the practical side. We are the largest department. Well, we're very proud of that. But how do you handle 2,000 undergraduate students with 43 faculty. How many students will you advise? The students, when they come in, by the time they're in junior year, or even earlier, they're actually writing their resume and finding out where they're going to go next. The only group of people who can effectively advise them, mentor them, especially on minorities and genders, but all are alumni. You are, in other words, our mentoring department. As you mentor the talent that is going out in future, you are telling the faculty that is working behind them, these are the important things. So we look for your input. So alumni can help many ways. And as one of the comments I think Larry made, I don't know where we are going in terms of ranking, but we will not get there wherever we want to go without a strong alumni component. So. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll have time for one more question. And as before, you can cheat and answer the question you'd like to answer. Uh, and there's some dangerous questions in there, like more cool old stories. I don't think we want to ask that and still be, you know, be able to go in time for lunch. So, so I'll, I'll skip those questions, and maybe I'll, I'll ask a question relating to education. So. Agree or disagree, in the next five years, online course offerings will replace all undergraduate classes. Uh, okay, Rajesh. So uh, that question is rhetoric because obviously, you know, I mean, so I'm gonna do is, uh, clearly it will be a component of something. How big of a component we can spend lots of time but we don't have. I'm gonna actually look at the last question, uh, which says, what was your most humbling experience as a chair? Uh, that's a little bit personal, but I think it's important to understand that. And, you know, I went to undergraduate in IIT in India. This is a place that is far off some, it's, there's no civilization around it. It's a campus and you are, you are imprisoned there and you live in these hostels with terrible food and it doesn't matter whether your parents have a plane or they have a bicycle or none. You eat the same food, same crappy food, and you have the same environment for them. And you live there for five years. In my days, now it's four years. And you get be become very friendly with your friends and so on. The only thing you do is study and study and study. And you're intensely competitive. Out of 300 students, there are probably four or five women. Uh, and that is it. When you come out of that background, and you go through your career and so on, until you become a chair, you don't really see the lives that the students live here. And my most humbling experience was realizing our undergraduates live a much more difficult life. Many of them are taking loans to be in the class. So if I cannot offer them a class, I'm asking them to spend more to be in the class. Many of them are supporting a family some of them are supporting a family close to them. And I said, you know, I grew up in this environment where I thought, why are you not just 
you know, you're thrown against the wall and you're very strong and technically and there's no other life. The students today come up with a much more, especially in this country, uh, much more uh, difficult circumstances, even though we are a first world country. And I am impressed with many students doing this balancing and still taking degree programs and so on and doing this. That probably has been the most humbling experience uh, that was only topped by another experience I had, which was how girls see computer science and, and sciences. And I'll leave that to discussion some other time. And, and I was just appalled with the, with the dropouts we have. Can you believe the graduation rate? We have about 800 seniors today in our class, and next day it will be 1,000. You know what percentage of them will actually walk through and get the degree? 40%. So there are life circumstances, of course. There are challenges in the department. That has been the most humbling experience that I have sort of worked on this. But anyway, I don't want to take all the time. Um, I don't think MOOCs are going to take over uh, undergraduate education. It'll be a component. I think they're going to be something like textbooks. And that we'll end up having perhaps more instruction being done online and more lab time working on closely on projects and such. It may be a change but I don't think it's gonna replace it. Um, my most humbling experience, um, when I was chair, uh, uh, one of the things I was able to do was uh, work for Beth Simon. Uh, she was running, uh, she was introducing this uh, graphics-based, basically it was our introductory Java programming, and I got to be one of her lab instructors. And uh, that was humbling because I got to work with students, many of them who were terrified of computers, terrified of programming, and the idea that, that Beth had was to, as part of this project, part of the class to have an art exhibit where the students would use the things they'd learned in programming uh, and go out and take pictures around campus, form a collage and put them up and show people what, the, what they look like and uh, then be there with their art and their computer program to be able to explain what, what was happening. And so I, I was one of the judges because you always drag a chair in to do something like this. And what was humbling were the students who were telling me that they were just loving it. And they would tell you how they had crafted their loops and what they were doing to make it efficient and how they got these interesting effects and how they spent 40 hours that week to do this and their, their, off, or their suite mates thought they were crazy because when they took CSA 8A before, it was such a dull class that they wanted it to get over with. So seeing that kind of... Uh, engagement was, uh, I was quite humbled by it all. One other thing uh, that you might uh, bring up in connection with Beth Simon uh, is the new paradigm uh, in teaching which goes under the name flipping the classroom, in which, uh, as they say, instead of being a sage on the stage, you're a guide from the side. <laughs> that is, uh, you suggest problems, students work in groups, you have clickers, and uh, certainly we're experimenting with that, and uh, we're finding our way. It works uh, uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's not perfect yet, but we're still working. And in connection with posters, I should mention that there's a very nice set of more than 50 posters that I encourage people to go out and take a look, because students have put a lot of effort, and, uh, and some are quite nice. So. Uh, so <clears throat> online courses are not going to replace uh, regular classes entirely in the next 10 years. But there's one thing that they're really doing very well, I think, and that is encouraging uh, peer review, that uh, somebody can put their solution out and then have other students uh, comment on them. And it's an extremely good way of learning, both for the person who's doing the commenting and the student who's doing the, uh, receiving the feedback. And we need to find more and more ways to structure it so that it isn't just the professor grading the test or just quizzing the student, but it's uh, make use of the fact that we have large numbers of students in a positive way rather than viewing it as a negative thing. Um, I think the um, thing that was perhaps most disappointing about being chair for me was um, and perhaps in as also as, as associate dean in other roles I've played, is not being able to attract more women and more um, uh, people from underrepresented groups into the field. 
Uh, but I want to end on a positive note. So I want to say something that no one said before about the spirit of the department. Um, when I came here, um, one of the things that um, made it easy to um, become chair, although it took a lot of arm twisting by Gil and, and uh, Bob Kahn's part, but um, was the um, real sense in the department that we do things for the good of the department. And um, that, I don't know if people realize how unique that is. As I've come to work with many different departments across campus and in other places, it really is unique. And I credit um, a lot of that with you know, many of the people who uh, were here, but um, a large part to Christos Papadimitriou, who uh, never was chair. He never was, would be sitting up here. I think he was vice chair under Gill. But he um, had a way of operating in the department that really made people think about what would really, you know, get beyond their selfish interest of, you know, I want this or that or that, and really think about what would be great for the department. And that made the job of chair really so much easier. <clears throat> so she mentioned, uh, <clears throat> she mentioned Christos, and so let me tell a little story about him because I see he's going to talk here. Uh, when I was chair, uh, the mail room was near my office, and uh, Christos would come down, get his mail, come in and tell me what he was working on, which I always liked to hear. I thought, wow, this guy's really smart. And he'd go back to his office, but he'd forget his mail. He'd put it on the table. And this went on rarely, fairly regularly for a while. And I think I must have mentioned it to Julie or, or uh, Dave Wargo or Steve Hopper or Glenn Little or somebody. And uh, I, I, so I was in there one day, and he came in, went out, left his mail, and he came back in and he said to me, he said, you know, Gil, he said, I think I'm getting that disease. I can't think of the name of it. It begins with an A. And <laughs> I almost had a heart attack. And then I realized he was pulling my leg. <laughs> um, you get a lot of help when you're chair from the staff. We had great <coughs> staff when we started. Uh, uh, Patty Shermer was the MSO and we had Greg Hidley and then Rick Ord as uh, running the technical side, and uh, they are so supportive. Um, another thing I was going to mention was the, my, one of my best moments wasn't as chair, it was when I came and I started teaching here. Uh, I was assigned uh, three, uh, uh, three graduate classes, a sequence of three graduate classes, and uh, those students were great. I was so happy. I still remember lots of them, and they, uh, you know, that, that, that feeling that the whole place, uh, their pride in the place, I don't know, it grew, you know, and that, that, that feeling you mentioned is, uh, it's great to hear that it's still there. As for the rankings, you know there's more than five in the top five. I mean, everybody, there's more than five people who think they're in the top five. So, uh, for sure, when we came, we thought we were in the top, when I came, we thought we were in the top 25 given that there's more than 25 in the top 25. And uh, then maybe we got up to the top 20, and uh, when we, by the time we were uh, a department, maybe near there. And uh, now, wherever we are, um, it's uh, maybe I think the department could be in the top five if there are more than five in the top five. So, uh, <laughs> so it shouldn't take too long. <laughs> but it's very, very hard to move up. Uh, the rankings aren't the most important thing anyway. It's to have a great, uh, a great place to learn computer science and to do computer science research. And that's, uh, that's what they've done here over the past 20 years uh, or 25 years is truly amazing. And I, it's a source of great pride to me to have been here at the start. And I'm so impressed by what the people who stayed and the people who joined them achieved. It's amazing. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, I can re I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said because I agree with it all. Um, but I will say that uh, certainly as far as online teaching is concerned, uh, MOOCs, I don't think that's going to, I think the question says, will all courses be replaced by, I think the word all is wrong here. Uh, it's really going to be, there will be some courses possibly that are done online, maybe even more than just uh, uh, automated grading. But 
Computer science is evolving, will continue to evolve. And with this, there will be, even at the undergraduate level, these courses with new topics. And this will be taught by experts in their fields. Uh, this is the only way that, that it can be done. Um, I'm just looking at the rest of the questions here. Um, I know people are getting hungry. Uh, I, I won't, uh, I guess, say much more, but uh, okay, what did I want to do? Boy, what do I want to do when I grow up? Oh, oh, when I grow up, gee. This is, this is a tough question because there's so many possibilities. Uh, 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 there's still lots of possibilities, uh, even with gray hair. I think I'll stop talking and turn things back over to our, to Vinette. Okay, well, let's thank the panel. <laughs>